Okay, my name is Drew Lyon. I'm the new extension uh, weed scientist in, in Pullman. And so I'm getting to know this uh, country a little bit. I have a little bit to learn, quite a bit, a little bit to learn yet. Hail from western Nebraska where I did a lot of work with crop rotations on, on their impact on winter annual grasses, which is what Frank was talking about. And so we're pretty positive on the effect of rotation. And I would say our gentleman from Oklahoma, um, Tom Peeper, who is a weed scientist at Oklahoma State, was a big pusher to get winter canola in that rotation to fight those winter annual grasses. So weed scientists really are, are pretty uh, big on rotation because we know the, the real benefit it has for weed control. I've been asked to speak to you today about record keeping and some soil residue issues that might come up when trying to uh, add canola to your rotation. So um, we'll get into that here and discuss some of the things you need to keep an eye on. Um, record keeping, it's a very exciting topic and um, I'm gonna hope to keep you awake long enough to get through it and into something maybe a little more exciting. But as uh, uninteresting it is, as it is, it's very critical uh, to keep good records for, uh, for a number of reasons, which I'm gonna go through. But one of the important reasons I'm bringing it up here is because you need to know what products are out there because some of the herbicides, particularly in these rotations where fallow are, is part of the rotation, some of these products we use uh, in wheat and in fallow situations have very long soil, or soil residuals that can affect canola. Canola is a pretty sensitive crop to some of these group two herbicides in particular. And if you don't know where you have those uh, and when you put them on, you could, you could get yourself into some real trouble. So we want to keep records. It's required for restricted use pesticides. You have to keep records of all your restricted use pesticides. Um, that's a, a federal requirement. Uh, it aids in management decisions. Again, kind of what I was getting aiming at before, if you know where, where you have these products, it can keep you from putting the wrong crop in behind them. Um, provides liability protection. If you have good records and somebody thinks something happened that didn't happen, you can show them that it didn't happen. Uh, it can be used to justify insurance claims. Uh, requested in real estate transfers, uh, if you're gonna be selling some land, uh, or if you're gonna be taking over some land as a, as a new um, tenant on some land, it's good to know what's out there. Uh, can assist in medical personnel uh, when they come in if there's pesticide exposure, and it's also needed to compile a pest management plan. So all very good reasons to keep it. We're gonna talk a little bit uh, about uh, its use from a management standpoint. There are several record programs out there. You can get them for computers. You can get them um, as sheets that you keep. Um, I did a quick Google search and found a couple uh, forms that I thought did a pretty good job of keeping track, asking you the questions. This one provides uh, an area to put a field map in. In fact, uh, that's probably as critical as anything is to have the area mapped out well, what products you used, when, uh, and, and the like. Another one that's really good, this restricted use one, could be used for everything. In fact, I would suggest if you gotta use it for restricted use, why not keep track of everything? Um, ask all these questions, name, certification, EPA registration, um, location, crop. Um, now, this was not a biased search. I did, not, I did not go in there and ask for stuff from Nebraska, but these were Nebraskan uh, sheets that could be found at this uh, URL pested.unl.edu. So you can go there and find either one of those forms and then maybe adapt it. And I would suggest um, that we might want to consider adding a column, as we have here on your right, um, of a recrop interval, where we can put in what the recrop intervals to some of the crops we might have in our rotation would be. Uh, I just made up some of these things, but th throw in some locations, a crop you planted, and then what's the rotation restriction to some various crops. So um, there might be a column you might want to add into these to keep track of uh, rotation restrictions so you know next year and two years, and actually some of these things have rotation restrictions for three years or more. So you have to keep track of this for a fairly long time. So let's talk about some of these herbicides that uh, are causing, uh, can cause you some real problems with canola production. Uh, Frank talked about the, the group two uh, chemistries, which we use quite a bit in winter wheat production. Uh, these are the ALS inhibitors. Uh, 
the big, two big guys in that group are the sulfonylureas and the imidazolones. Um, you're familiar with all these uh, products, um, and many of them have very long rotation restrictions. Um, basically, what you see with either one of these, either the AL inhibitors are shown in the picture, you get kind of a yellowing and a stunting. It tends to happen near the growth point, so the new growth there in the middle, uh, the newer growth is what's going to be affected. Basically, these products prevent the uh, production of several amino acids, which are important for cell development, and so basically the plant runs out of the building blocks it needs to make new cell walls and new uh, lipids. And so basically it sits there and it basically starves to death and dies eventually. Sometimes they don't starve, sometimes they just sit there really small for a long time. But that's the general symptomology you'll see, sometimes a purpling to it, and, but often stunting and this yellowing. So those are the group twos, and those are probably the ones we have the greatest concern with. Some of these have rotation restrictions of three years or more. Um, if you look at a field where some of this uh, injury might uh, be occurring, you'll see a field and you'll just have these areas where the, the stand is not looking real good. And you, you kind of question now, uh, what could be happening there? You know, do I have insect problems? Do I have um, the, the drill not work? What's going on? Um, so you get kind of this irregular um, thinning. It's not total thinning. There's still plants out there, but they're not, uh, they're not doing like they are in the rest of the field. If you get up a little closer, you'll see plants. You'll see some plants, uh, such as the plant that's on your left there that um, is looking fairly healthy. And then right next to it, you'll find a plant that's uh, smaller, stunted. And if you come across the row there, you see some that are really quite small and not doing very well at all. You can have it all occur in a fairly short uh, distance within a field. And if you see that kind of irregular pattern, that's something you might uh, call or start thinking about herbicide carryover. Here's a, some close-ups you can see on the lower left, that growing point there, how it's kind of really stunted, just little tiny leaflets that aren't going anywhere. Uh, the, one, the one leaf there is turning purple, and on the right you have the same sort of thing. On the, on the left, on the lower right picture, you have um, a healthy plant there on the left, and on the right you see one that's got the carryover symptoms, so the, you have that uh, main growing point. The cotyledons look fine, but the new growth, a new leaf, is uh, stunted and not doing very well. So that, that's the kind of, it, it doesn't just jump out and bite you that that's what's happening when you look, look at it in the field. If, if I wasn't showing you these pictures and you saw those in the field, it wouldn't, it wouldn't just jump out at you. You have these little differences in growth and stuff. So it takes a little, a little detective work to, to figure it out. But those are some of the general things you look for. And these kind of symptomologies uh, can be a real problem if you're trying to get canola started. Um, so if you've used any of these chemistries, you need to be real careful about that. Some other uh, groups that cause problems are the triazinones or group 14. These are PPO inhibitors, Spartan and Valor. Uh, both can be used in uh, some of the legume crops, pulse crops, and those can carry over. And then the group 27, which are the HPPD inhibitors, uh, the pyrazolinones, uh, Husky is one of these. Husky has, I think, a nine-month rotation restriction, so it's not real long. But we have some plants up here uh, with, with husky injury on them, so you can see what they look like. But those are basically the groups that are, are of most concern when growing canola. And I would say the group two are by far the most widely used and the most uh, concerning with the longest rotation. So if we look at the recrop intervals here, um, these, this first slide is of the uh, group twos here, uh, all SUs. You can see that uh, the rotation restrictions uh, last anywhere from uh, just a few months in the case of Maverick, uh, if you're using Clearfield varieties, uh, up to over almost three years, 34 months. Uh, these ranges, uh, if you look at Ally Extra there at the top, 10 to 22 months, uh, that you have to look on the label, they have pH and rainfall restrictions, so depending on where your pH, the really low pH is and the really high pH is, it tends to hang around long, longer. And they also usually have some kind of amount of rainfall, 10, 18 inches that you have to have between the time you applied and when you plant. And you have to meet both those guidelines before you can plant. A number of these, such as Amber and Finesse, just say field bioassay. And if you read the label, the field bioassay means you have to go out there and plant some strips across your field. And I'll talk a little bit about how you do that later. And those things have to come up and look good 
And if that happens, then the next year you can plant the crop. Um, how many people have done that before? I, I don't know very many people who have. It's, it's, uh, it's basically they're not real sure how long it's going to take. And they're, they're telling you that uh, it's probably not a real wise idea to be growing those crops if you have to do a field bioassay before you plant it. Uh, some of these, we do have some um, SU tolerant varieties and you can sh uh, and clear field varieties and that shortens up the intervals. Um, and then some of them are just dependent on rainfall. Here's the imidazinones and some of the others. Uh, again, beyond, if, if you looked at the previous one, well, here at Beyond, we have canola uh, zero months. That's if you have a clear field variety. So if you have a clear field canola and you put Beyond on your wheat, you can come right back and plant clear field. On the previous slide, you can see that, um, that under Maverick, if you have a clear field variety, you can plant canola three months after. So there's a little bit of conference of tolerance in an IMI canola to an SU but it's not as good as to an IMI. So at zero months if you're planting an IMI tolerant behind an IMI, where it's three months behind an SU. So um, pursuit beyond, again, uh, here's one pursuit uh, come across there. NS is next season, so if you have a clear, a clear field variety, you can plant that the next season after you apply pursuit. Um, I had a little trouble trying to figure out what next season means. Um, you have to wait a calendar year next season, or is it, you know, if you plant a winter crop, can you come in in the fall? Uh, it wasn't real clear there. Um, one of the interesting ones was Spartan, uh, 24 months to canola and 12 months to mustard, which I, I, I think that's somewhere where the label isn't real clear. My guess is that uh, in most of these, if you look, mustard's more sensitive than canola to the, those residues. What happens is they didn't list mustard, and they said anything that's not on the label shown on this recrop restriction, you plant in 12 months. And mustard's not there, so you can, or you can plant in 12 months. But they had canola on the label, and they said 24 months to canola. My guess would be you'd want to wait 24 months on mustard at least, uh, because it's more sensitive than the others. So anyhow, you want to really look at those labels and see what your recrop restrictions are. A lot of times it's going to be pH dependent and it's going to be rainfall dependent. And on several of those, uh, you're going to have to do a field bioassay or wait at least, uh, a lot of times it's three to four years before you can plant anything. Here's a uh, slide that was sent to me by Jim Davis uh, at the University of Idaho. And this was a, uh, some screening work they were doing. They had some, a field where they had pursuit out on the field and they planted a, a clear field canola on the left or an imitolerant canola and a susceptible and you can see the, the difference in size between those different canolas. The imi canola uh, just doesn't seem to be showing any effects whereas the non imi is showing a lot of stunting um, and that, that canola is not going to do very well compared to the imi tolerant. So there are some varieties out there if you know you have a, a pursuit or, or something uh, beyond out there. You can look for IMI tolerant canolas um, for your area. Um, so that might be a way to, to work around this. Okay, I mentioned several products required a field bioassay. And if I recall, nobody in the room has done a field bioassay before. Um, so this, these are the instructions for how you're supposed to do a field bioassay. Um, you should plant one or more strips across the field. These should be perpendicular to the way you sprayed. So you don't want to, if you sprayed north-south, you don't want to put your bioassay north-south because you might just catch uh, a skip or you might catch an overlap or you might catch something. So you want to plant, per plant perpendicular to the way you sprayed so you don't catch any of those things. You want to include one or more sensitive crops and the crop that you're going to be planting. So. I have a slide coming up which shows some of the sensitive crops you can use for different herbicides. Different crops are more sensitive to different herbicides, so you want to keep those in there. And then you want to try to find an area to, to serve as a check. So you want to hopefully have somewhere in that field where no herbicide was applied, where you feel for pretty confident that you can say, okay, this is what it looks like without anything on it. How does it look where we sprayed? Uh, you want to plant as close to normal time as feasible. In other words, you don't want to be planting really early so the plant gets off to a real slow start or really late so it uh, comes up a lot quicker than it might normally come up. 
And then you want to allow enough time for the plants to grow enough to show injury if they're going to show injury. So all those requirements uh, take some time and really for most people would mean that if you have a successful one, by the time you're able to put this out, interpret the results, you're probably out of the growing season for that year anyhow and you're going to have to, you know, if it's successful, you can plant the next year. So, any questions on field bioassays? Probably better just to keep good records and stay away from products that are going to cause you problems because uh, I know nobody who's ever done a field bioassay, <laughs> even though it's on the label. There's another approach, it's not on the label, uh, but it might give you some hints on what to do. It's a uh, plant up bioassay, and if you look at the front table here, we, we did a little field, uh, plant bioassay uh, before coming. And um, this is another way to, kind of a quick and dirty way to see whether you really have problems. It doesn't fulfill the, the, the uh, label requirements, but it can give you some good information. Now, a plant bioassay is only as good as the uh, soil sampling technique you use. So if you go out and you do a poor job of sampling your soil and then run a bioassay and, and you don't see anything, um, it's because of your sample. You have, to do, you have to really do a good job of sampling your field. So you want to collect samples from both contaminated and clean sites. You generally want to sample to three inch depth unless it's tilled. If it's tilled, then you want to sample to whatever depth you tilled it to. Uh, you want to take separate samples from high and low spots because you want differences in how the different soil types might be. And then you want to take several samples from each area and combine them because you're going to need enough to fill four to six pots. But you want to, you want to know where you got those samples from um, and do it. Then you want to air dry and store cool. You don't want to dry it in an oven. Uh, you don't want to leave it wet because further degradation can occur. You want to dry it, air dry and then keep it in a cool place until you're ready to run the plant bioassay. And then here's uh, just a little table that shows some of the uh, different herbicide groups and some of the test species you might uh, want to use and some of the injury symptoms that uh, you can see. Uh, what you can see on there is uh, sugar beets, canola tend to be on the list of sensitive crops because canola is just sensitive to a lot of different herbicides. So. Um, Canola is a test crop, and then some of these other ones are too. So you plant it, uh, your pots, you have your untreated and your treated, and you let them grow for a while, and then you can compare them. You can see if they're stunting, uh, if there's any of those other symptoms. Um, in the case of uh, photosystem two things, uh, inhibitors like atrazine, you get intervenal chlorosis and yellowing. Um, PPO inhibitors give you leaf necrosis and stem girdling. So you're looking for those symptoms uh, between your untreated and your treated soil. And if you come up here and look, what we have is we have different herbicides. We planted the uh, canola in these uh, soils that were treated with, a, with a, a small amount of the product. And then we have three different varieties. We have one that's an IMI canola variety. We have one that's a SU tolerant canola. And we have one that's just a standard canola and you can look through there and see whether you can see the differences of these different canola types and what kind of symptomologies they're growing. In the back there's a few pots that are untreated so they show you about what the plant would look like if it had no, soil, no herbicide residue on it and um, that's how you'd run the study. You'd compare your check to your different treatments and see whether you have it. Now again this just gives you a good idea if you did a good job of soil sampling and it does not fill, fulfill label requirements for a field bioassay. This is not considered a field bioassay. Anybody had, had those problems where they've had to carry over to canola? It's, it's, a big, it's a big issue and we'll probably keep a number of people, if you're just thinking about doing canola now and you haven't changed what herbicides you're using for the last year or two or three, it could keep you out of canola for a while. Um, as you're noticing, some of those very common wheat herbicides, you're going to be looking at least uh, probably two, maybe sometimes three years before you come back with canola. And I would encourage you to come up here, if we have a few minutes at breaks, come up and circle through. It's not, we can't get all of you up here at once, but if you want to circulate through and just take a look and, and see what you see.